thy knife chip and shatter. May thy knife chip and shatter. All right, so at this point, there's really no need to recap the profound initial success of Dune Part 2, the long-awaited follow-up to 2021's Part 1, directed and co-written by Denis Villeneuve. And there are plenty of wonderful examinations on everything this film does well from a technical filmmaking point of view. There are plenty of walkthroughs on what Villeneuve has changed from the original 1965 Frank Herbert novel. So here, I want to consider the pros and cons of Dune Part 2 when it comes to storytelling in particular. I mean, as a cinematic experience, a visceral, sensory experience in terms of production value, technicalities of filmmaking, Dune Part 2 is pretty obviously an absolute knockout, and I'll be involving those elements here in the context of their role in storytelling, so it might not warrant repeating, but the quality of the film does merit emphasizing right at the outset here. This is just an awesome piece of cinema. It's a genre definitive, it's rendered clearly, it's not trying to be the next anything. This is a story and a lore that Villeneuve has loved his whole life, so we're seeing not just Dune, but Villeneuve's Dune. And it's an exciting time for cinema. We had months of build-up here, with every reviewer saying you have to see this on the biggest screen possible. We had young, charismatic talent promoting the film left, right, and center in high fashion, hyping up their own work, telling us all how good it would be. Planting superstitions. Preparing the way. And there is no doubt that Dune Part 2 is absolutely amazing. A wonderful experience at the cinema. So much craft and technique went into its production. As a film, it definitely amazes. But nonetheless, as a story, it didn't quite affect me. Again, I was, and remain, amazed. But Villeneuve's approach here does build spectacle over intimacy. And in Dune, the world and the story are beautifully intertwined, so Villeneuve's outstanding work here does go a long way. But as the narrative unfolds, and in looking at the way the story itself is rendered, for all the comparisons to Lord of the Rings, through both Villeneuve's choice of substance and his exercise of form, as we'll see throughout this video, Dune Part 2 operates in an entirely different way with a completely different effect. Herbert, as an author, was quite taken with this idea that we read in rhythm, and because he wanted to communicate on a subconscious level through his book, he apparently wrote a great deal of Dune in verse, first in sonnets or haikus, and then adapted them into regular prose. And to me, though I don't think this is actually the case, sort of feels like Villeneuve interpreted the verse rather than the prose. In the films, we lose a great deal of Dune's noteworthy inner narratives, but I'm sure one reason why even diehard book fans are blown away here is in how Villeneuve captured the more poetic beauty of Herbert's works and world, perhaps not in linguistic rhythm, but certainly in underlying essence. Now, before looking at a few storytelling devices that Villeneuve employs here, I want to sort of set the table by looking at what he's chosen to focus on in his version of Herbert's seminal work. Obviously, spoilers ahead for Dune Parts 1 and 2, as well as the first Dune novel, and I'm not going to go through a full summary of the plot here, so I've linked a handy breakdown in the description in case that's helpful, and that's actually part of the challenge in adapting this sci-fi epic. Frank Herber intentionally wrote a narratively and thematically dense novel with the idea that readers could go back and back and focus on different through lines each time. And I do believe that you can do that with Villeneuve's films. They are very laced with details that easily get buried under the scope and magnitude of the worlds, and that absolutely invites rewatches. But no film, of course, could do justice to the density of the novel. So Villeneuve chose to focus on the machinations of the Bene Gesserit as his most prominent throughline. It's a smart choice, since they are the puppet masters, but it also explains why something like true character motivation is often a little murky in this film. Now, the other major focus of Villeneuve's is to ensure that we, the audience, know exactly what to think about Paul's trajectory. Sort of famously, Frank Herbert himself was pretty frustrated by Paul's reception after the first Dune book. Readers were rooting for Paul too much, so he went on to write Messiah to clear things up a bit. And we'll come back to this on the section on Paul, but in considering the film as a whole, in considering what Villeneuve chooses to heighten or minimize or cut altogether, it's key to note that he has a clear topical focus, the Bene Gesserit plot, and 
a clear thematic message, Paul goes bad. And he said in multiple interviews that he wanted to make that abundantly clear to sort of avoid what happened with the book. And look, as a preface here, I want to be clear that I respect and admire this version of Dune. I think it was a monumental feat of cinema, and understanding Villeneuve's style of storytelling helped me enjoy it for what it is. But that style is a two-sided coin, and we can absolutely celebrate this cinematic achievement while recognizing that his choices do hamper the story's capacity for persuasion and intimate effect. I think Dune Part 2 is incredible, but it has to be watched on its own terms and with appreciation for how Villeneuve chooses to tell his version of the story. So to explore this film, we're going to look at four facets of storytelling. The use of symbolism, what we the audience are informed about and how, Chani's role, and the ambiguity of Paul. If you're new to the channel, please do subscribe, and if you've already subscribed, I appreciate it. Welcome back. Wadib. The prophet. The one who points the way. Wadib means kangaroo mouse. An unusual warning for a Fremen. Villeneuve, particularly in partnership with cinematographer Greg Frazier, is obviously a master at working through the visual language of film. Every frame throughout the runtime is absolutely gorgeous. The background details and just the way both people and objects move through space is absolutely captivating. But the visual language here is also a key communicator of theme, meaning, and even plot. This tactic certainly helps the film involve or nod to elements of the book that couldn't quite explicitly make it on screen, and for the most part, symbolism here is absolutely stunning and effective. I'm not going to walk through every example, but there are visual echoes from part one in particular that indicate just how meticulously every inch of this world is laid out. And any time a film adaptation has to make cuts from a book, I love when a director chooses to give little nods for book fans to enjoy. So for example, throughout the film, Chani starts wearing, though ultimately removes, a blue scarf. And in the book, this is how Fremen women indicate pregnancy. We don't have time for that here, so instead, it's just a mark of love. And because Fremen eyes are blue from spice, and the water of life is also blue, we have this neat conceptual blue triangle, sort of, and Paul obviously makes his choice. Almost in precise oppositional symmetry is Paul's wearing and non-wearing of the Atreides ducal ring, which we'll come back to in his section. And though the actual history and customs of the Atreides aren't all that involved in this portion, Villeneuve uses very clear visuals to indicate how the Fremen cause is overwhelmed by the Atreides one. Paul unites two customs in his final knife fight, uttering Fremen words while giving an Atreides salute. Jessica is set apart from the other Bene Gesserit in her Fremen earth-toned garb, indicating how she's ingratiated herself in the culture that she manipulates, and how she's in continued defiance of her own order. But even more importantly, we see the Fremen ride to battle carrying the Atreides flag. And this is pivotal to the broad tragedy of the final act. The dissolution of the Fremen identity and purpose under Paul's leadership, but Phil Nov doesn't really make us feel that loss. He rather shows it through the flags. And in an easily missable moment, we also see dead bodies being burnt in the Harkonnen style rather than the Fremen way of collecting their water. Symbolic to theme, sure, but it's also pivotal to the plot. Fremen collect water to eventually terraform Arrakis into a green paradise, but if you're not tracking that, it's pretty subtle. Obviously, the optics of this white savior figure speak for themselves, so I'm not saying Paul's maneuvers are subtle here, far from it, but the cultural devastation being implied through symbolism rather than explored through narrative is certainly a storytelling choice. Paul, of course, chooses the humble desert mouse as his name, and more on that later, but it's no accident that he's dressing himself in humility as he launches a very unhumble campaign. Rather like dragon riding being emblematic of House Targaryen, worm riding is emblematic of the Fremen ability to work with, not against, the hostility of their planet. This is likewise true of their relationship to Spice. And look, the value and utility of Spice was definitely underplayed in this film, which is a problem, but its symbolic significance to the Fremen certainly isn't. Likewise, I love how we spend time with the Fremen ways of harnessing the elements, including wind, as integral parts of their way of life. 
All of these sequences lead to a really effective contrast with Getty Prime, the Harkonnen home planet, where feckless indulgence and pollution rots away under an infrared sun. I mean, on a very plain level, it just looks stunning. It sort of shocks you out of your seat, but it's also an effective way of communicating that absolutely nothing can grow here. No plants, no color, no compassion, no wisdom, just industry and greed and violence. So when Paul says that he'll win the war by being Harkonnen, we know exactly what he means. This dismal environment helps explain why Fade Ralpha is who he is. We sort of get the sense that he and Paul are two sides of the same coin. Perhaps Paul would have been just like Fade Ralpha if he hadn't been raised under the ethic of House Atreides and the kindness of his father. I also loved the clear symmetry between both the Baron and Lady Jessica, each subjecting their successors to life-threatening tests as rites of passage. And that takes us to connections between part one and part two. Again, there are so many visual and behavioral echoes that are a true joy to go back and track, but the most significant is the most obvious. They each end with a knife fight that represents Paul's diminishing humanity. He's certainly not asking Fade Rotha to yield the way he was in part one. And look, it would probably make more structural narrative sense here to introduce this rival Fade Rotha way earlier in the film, to go back and forth and build up tension. But Villeneuve's sneaky trick as a filmmaker is in using visual continuity even when he's jumping around in time and space. You know, we might zoom in on someone's face, they turn their head, new scene. And if we cut back and forth from the bad guys to the good-ish guys, all the seams of the story would be glaringly apparent. We'd feel lost in a way that we don't notice we are, given his filmmaking and editing. Everything in Villeneuve's world is a little more beautiful and a little less structurally sensible. And we could spend all day listing these symbolic details, but the reason I've highlighted symbolism here as a storytelling method is because as we get into the character work, it's crucial to note that Villeneuve uses his characters symbolically as well, I'd argue, to very mixed effect. The clearest example is really Stilgar, who feels less like a human guy and more like a storytelling stand-in for the concept of faith and fanaticism. And I've seen takes that Stilgar's humanity slowly diminishes as he becomes more and more obsessed with Paul, and I like that concept, but I think it's being a little generous. Pretty sure Villeneuve just used him in a very straightforward way. He's one of the most prominent characters, but he ultimately doesn't have a ton to do besides represent a bigger idea and millions of people, and he's played large for laughs. And in terms of efficiency, this is a very smart storytelling move, but for me, considering that the film's overarching concept hinges on the manipulation of faith, hinges on how an oppressed people have been wrongly steered through centuries of lies, I think this symbolic representation is kind of a cop-out away from actually investigating that pivotal theme. I don't know that we should be laughing at the saddest theme here, and it could have been a bolder move to have Paul actually choose to kill Stilgar when he offers. I don't want to see that, but that's kind of the point. Instead, we get a verbal echo of something Duke Leto said in part one, which is sort of emblematic of how Villeneuve opts for symbolic maneuvers over narrative ones. I'll continue to refer to the visual storytelling here, but overall, I want to be clear that Villeneuve's use of symbolism is incredible. It's absolutely captivating, refreshing, exciting, it invites rewatches, it enhances the world, but it can also be a shortcut to letting us know how we should feel about something instead of actually making us feel it. And this takes us to how and what Villeneuve decides we need to know as the audience. You have much to learn. I will show you the ways of the desert. Part of audience communication is obviously world building, and in a heavily bizarre sci-fi book like Dune, there are so, so many elements that could easily look cheesy or out of place or just plain dumb, but Villeneuve took a genius approach to creating the world of Dune. Everything is a delicate balance of otherworldly and familiar. The super abstract technology of the world all feels like something I could hold, and my favorite tactic here is the use of biomimicry. The ornithopters obviously look like dragonflies, and in his dedication to natural filmmaking, Villeneuve made sure his sound team only used real recordings. So the ornithopter sound is layers of real beetles, cats purring, and canvas straps whirling in the air. That's so smart. I really feel like some part of our brains is able to connect with those noises in a way that helps this world really come alive. 
And the huge Harkonnen harvesters are clearly modeled after giant ticks, evoking this idea of parasitic extraction. Another wonderful example is the worms. So Herbert thought of them as whale-like equivalents, and Villeneuve really leans in. There is so much biomimicry to our reality throughout the design elements of this film, and I think it contributes to how these wildly unfamiliar shapes and technologies feel possible and alive and real. This is part of storytelling, of course. This world exists in our future, that's the whole speculative fiction aspect of it, and that feels possible somehow. But it's one thing to create the world, which I'd say Villeneuve has succeeded in doing well beyond anyone's expectations, and it's another to explain it to the audience. Some of this is done visually, such as the way grappling hooks pull back sort of nostril equivalents on the worms, so okay, that's how you keep them from diving back underground. But I also appreciate that Villeneuve doesn't feel the need to explain every little detail here. He said he knows how they dismount the worms. I don't know if I believe him, but I definitely don't care. And some of the explanation is done more explicitly. Irulan voices her historic diary. Chani and Stilgar explain aspects of Fremen culture. But a great deal of Dune's lore is sadly sort of left behind. For example, when we meet Gurney Halleck again, he mentions that he's been working as a spice smuggler. And it's your job to then imagine a greater spice economy and how it might work if you want to. And this is just the nature of film versus literature or television. You know, in the film, we hear the Baron and the Emperor talking about Maldib. Then, Irulan wonders aloud if Maldib could be Paul. So that's how we find out they don't know who Maldib is. We're basically just catching up. And this is a really fun concept, right? This idea that Maldib as a legend is spreading throughout the universe, but they don't know who he is. And it definitely would have lasted several episodes in a TV show, really building tension in that direction. Now, plenty of fans have noted that the pacing of Dune Part 2 can feel both exhilarating and a bit jarring. Usually, hearing someone like Stilgar say, okay, there's this Fremen test for you to do, you have to cross the desert, we would expect to see how that actually goes and have some sort of finality to it. But no, that's just a setup for bonding with Chani, then we're doing something else, then something else, and something else, and we just fill in the blanks ourselves. There is some visual trickery here that I mentioned earlier. We almost don't notice that we're leaving setups behind because of the beautiful flow of the editing. In Lord of the Rings, when we follow Aragorn's story in The Two Towers, we're only ever surprised by things he's also surprised by. For example, the sudden warg attack. It would be totally jarring if we were to cut to a scene where he's fighting some battle that he knew about in advance, but we didn't. That would really disrupt the narrative flow and connection to the characters. Here, we're thrown into these scenes all the time. We're constantly catching up to our own point of view. And that is part of the exhilarating energy of this film as an experience. It keeps us on the edge of our seat. I'd argue this method succeeds also in replicating the literary undercurrent of a larger-than-life force sort of shaping history in broad strokes. But it also puts us at a weird distance from the characters whose emotions we're supposed to share. And when the gap between what we know and what Paul knows explodes, this film feels more like a narratively oriented roller coaster than a piece of storytelling, which is, again, absolutely amazing. I'm feeling everything in my senses, my chair is shaking, but unlike Lord of the Rings, I'm not imbued with that narrative tension when we're, you know, prepping for battle. As I said in the intro, Villeneuve was focusing on the Bene Gesserit here. And and that choice makes plenty of sense. I do think, though, that it's a shame that so much of the ecology of the world and the politicking of the Emperor were lost. I'd love a little more dramatic emphasis, not necessarily time, but emphasis, on the Fremen's dream of terraforming Arrakis into a green planet. A U.S. Department of Agriculture plan to do basically just that out in Oregon was Herbert's initial inspiration for this entire text. But besides honoring the book, it would, I think, resonate more with audiences to see Paul manipulate the Fremen's environmental and political aim alongside the use of the creepy prophecies. And you know, not to get too nitpicky here, but one little problem in Dune is, I think, the demeanor of Christopher Walken as the Emperor. He seems pretty weak and kind of aimless and defeated from the get-go, and it's not really clear what exactly Paul is working against politically. And that's by design. Again, Villeneuve is more interested in Irulan and the Bene Gesserit than the Emperor, and that's fine. 
Finally, though it's absolutely impossible to involve all the subplots and histories of Herbert's Dune, I mean, this lore is so extensive. I do think audiences would really benefit from knowing the story of the Balerian Jihad, which vastly predates our main action here. But in their universe, there was a time when humans made computers so powerful that people were dominated by machines for centuries, until a long war and a big overthrow finally destroyed basically AI, leading to this ubiquitous law against creating machines in human likeness. Not only does that answer some of the tech discrepancies in the Dune universe, but it also explains the Bene Gesserit humanity test and emphasizes why rulers like Paul are so dangerous. They do your thinking for you. Herbert, in the 60s, wasn't worried so much about machines becoming too human-like, which is a common theme in sci-fi, but rather humans becoming too machine-like, over-reliant on external controllers and thinkers. I really think the story and the themes could have been enhanced by some reference to that history. But all in all, when it comes to adapting such a dense book, choosing what and how to communicate to the audience is a huge challenge. So I've been critical about what is communicated, but I do understand we can't expect everything. It's really in how we're carried through the narrative of events that I think hampers this film's ability to pull us intimately into the story. But as I keep saying, this is the trade-off of getting the immense epic scope and grandeur of Villeneuve's vision. Your blood comes from dukes and great houses. We don't have that here. Here, we're equal. In a nicely compelling mirror to Paul's inner conflicts, Johnny in Dune Part 2 comprises one extended contradiction that is a very welcome addition to her book character. Johnny is both fiercely protective of the ways of her people and in love with the guy whose presence threatens to disrupt them. And of course, she ultimately abandons the holy war cause, riding off into the desert. This isn't the first female character we've seen who guides a well-intended white guy with colonial links into their culture, but Shawnee, thankfully, goes beyond that cinematic Pocahontas trope by defying Paul in the end, and she has a few really powerful lines of dialogue, even in moments of affection, that maintain Paul's status as an outsider, not to her, but to her culture. Hers is the type of story we see in ancient verse and myth, almost an echo of Ariadne, but with more voice, complexity, and agency. And this is, of course, Villeneuve's biggest move to ensure that we know not to root for Paul. I think Zendaya does a great job with what she was given. That's sort of a given itself, but I can't lie. I do think Villeneuve's method of using characters as sort of semiotic communicators does somewhat flatten and inhibit our ability to connect with them deeply, getting in the way of their own purpose. Though we do get a few close-up scenes with Johnny, my favorite moment of hers is by far the little self-surprised laugh she lets out after she and Paul shoot down the ornithopter. It's a tiny detail that feels very human, and to me, builds up their love story even more powerfully than explicit romantic scenes. Any moment where these characters feel human helps us connect with them. You know, Paul pacing nervously before riding the worm, any scenes where they get to joke around. It creates audience buy-in that adds a personal sting to Paul's later betrayal in a really compelling way. But as the pace of the story quickens, we're sort of pushed away from these characters in a way that I found particularly disappointing with Johnny. And one huge piece of evidence of that distance is the death of Chani's friend Shishakli. We spend plenty of time with them, not just as political allies, but also as clearly affectionate friends. And then, for reasons that go unstated, Shishakli stays back to die a very brutal, lonely death at the hands of Fade Rotha, and she's never mentioned again. Not even a line from Chani, you know, brutally accepting her friend dying for the cause or anything like that. And based on the way Villeneuve is telling this story, that her death goes unmentioned isn't a plot hole or anything. As we've just reviewed, we have to fill in the blanks ourselves. But this approach does preclude a deeper connection to Chani. And make no mistake, I mean, the acting, the visuals, the score, the relational resonance to our reality, they all guide our emotions in the moment very effectively. But for Chani to be the heart and soul of the film, the way Villeneuve describes her to be, we should feel much more connected to her on a human level. Villeneuve also adds a pivotal Chani moment when Jessica compels her to reawaken Paul from his water-of-life-induced coma. 
We've heard Shawnee tell Paul that her Fremen name, which means Desert Spring, is part of some prophecy, and this scene is the payoff to that earlier setup. And the way the scene works, it seems like her tear is somehow actually magical in awakening Paul. If that's the case, we probably need more information on the details of that prophecy. This scene just sort of feels weirdly precise in an otherwise intentionally vague context otherwise. But the other read on this scene is more closely aligned to the book, and it's that Paul, through his Bene Gesserit training, has already survived the water, and he's intentionally manipulating Chani here because he and Jessica know it'll seem meaningful to their audience if she wakes him up. Chani seems to understand what's happened, and that's why she slaps him. And this is also nicely foreshadowed by that opening scene when Chani jokes about Paul fighting well after waking up, and he says, I wasn't actually sleeping. I don't know, I don't really like that, but it's much more coherent to me. It's definitely, though, not obvious. And either way, that Jessica uses the voice on Johnny makes the scene feel more forced than manipulated. And here, that Villeneuve skips over these causal explanatory links between scenes definitely gets in the way of just simply understanding what it is we're seeing. But look, if I had to pick one scene out of the whole film that just didn't work for me, it's definitely that one, and that's okay. So even putting it aside, I think the way Chani is rendered overall is weirdly a detriment to this film's persuasive capacity, even though that's precisely what she's here for. I know, she's the moral compass, she's the audience surrogate, if you don't know what to think about something, just use Chani's reaction. But we're never invited into her perspective, we just see it on Zendaya's face. So why, at the end, she's the only Fremen who doesn't buy Paul's shtick isn't really apparent. She was a skeptic from the get-go, so it's not the case that sharing his tent made her privy to his nightmarish visions. She's just somehow the only free-thinking person left. She doesn't have an arc, she doesn't realize anything she didn't already know, so neither do we and we kind of feel nothing. So look, it would sound weird to say that Chani as a storytelling point is weak here because she's absolutely crucial to the film's communicative purpose. But I think in the hands of a director who cared more about our emotions in the story and less about our experience in the cinema, we wouldn't actually need her. We'd be Chani, compelled by Paul's better nature and betrayed by his worse. We'd walk out of the cinema feeling the tragedy internalized, maybe even a sense of guilt forever rooting for him. And don't get me wrong, I want her here, I like this character, I mean, how could you not? She's basically the perfect person. It works. It absolutely works, but again, for me, I had to bear in mind that Villeneuve communicates more symbolically than emotionally, or else I do expect more of an intimate connection with the supposed heart of the film. And as I've hopefully been demonstrating, this comes down to processing Dune Part 2 the way it was meant to be processed. Instead of expecting emotional payoff that was ultimately meant to be implied in our minds rather than instilled in our hearts. Suppose I presented the Emperor with an alternative to chaos, and the Emperor has no sons and his daughters are yet to marry. You'd make a play for the throne. Besides, you know, the giant sandworms, one reason why Dune has long been considered unfilmable is the heavy extent to which it revolves around the internal ruminations and moral agonizing of Paul. As the character with both the most and the least agency, there are plenty of parallels between Paul and Hamlet. Two protagonists who know what they must do but can't stomach actually doing it, both operating under epistemic regimes construed well beyond human elements, and it's no accident that many aspects of this film's conclusion actually bear resemblance to Hamlet. Never doubt that I love to Ophelia. I will love you as long as I breathe to Chani, a courtly duel finale, everyone subsumed by revenge. But where Hamlet can pace around and pontificate about his issues, where theater operates on dialogue, Villeneuve has to use other strategies here. The first is Villeneuve's strong suit, right? Visual communication. We obviously get some of Paul's visions and nightmares, but we also get many shots of Paul as a tiny little figure in a far more immense world, whether that backdrop is a sweeping eco-landscape or a chanting swarm of people. And this is why I love Chalamet's casting here. I mean, look at this guy. He's just a little guy. He takes up less space than his own shadow in more ways than one. Dune Part 2 often switches between large scope visuals to zooming in on Chalamet's poetic face, building an implied association between the enormity of the world and one guy's thoughts. This, to me, is all rendered absolutely 
perfectly. This Visuals Dream Team has absolutely manipulated scope, lighting, and mood to the point where we can obviously feel the grand significance of Paul's words and actions beyond their immediate context. Every moment in this film feels immense because every moment is. Another strategy is to externalize Paul's inner conflict through simplifying book Jessica and heightening book Chani into symbolic representations of Paul's conflicting desires. I can't lie, I miss the Lady Jessica from part one in the book. I preferred her sort of conflicted survivalism to this deliberate scheming, but in condensing the nuances of the book to make this all on film, this decision makes plenty of sense. We've already talked about Chani, but again, even with my complaints, it certainly works overall. But this takes us to Paul's narrative journey in this film and how it reflects who he is internally. And because I'm about to be pretty critical, I'll reiterate that I enjoy and respect what we got, and that this version of Paul may be a byproduct of that choice to focus on the Bene Gesserit as the major throughline, so all of this may end up clicking into place once we get the third installment. But let's take a look. So there are two distinct readings of Paul here. One makes more sense to me based on the book and the film's moods and everything Villeneuve has said, but the other is more logically coherent based on the scenes and dialogue we get. And before looking at those two, I just want to refer back to the Paul of Herbert's book. And we certainly don't need to evaluate the film based on accuracy to the book, but one core purpose, one identifying feature of Dune is its deep interrogation of not just charismatic leaders, but also the monomyth of fiction. Book Paul is a constant character. He doesn't radically change until he drinks the water of life and is imbued with Megasite, becoming the Kwisat Haderach. But even then, his entire purpose revolves around diminishing net suffering. He's always in agony because he knows he's the man with the lever in the trolley problem. And that's totally circumstantial, right? This is the problem of the monomyth and how it revolves around one person. And based on what Paul has seen in the book, if he doesn't pull that lever, if he doesn't lead the Fremen, far more people will die than if he does. We then wonder if there was ever another way. We wonder about the ends versus the means. We wonder about the epistemic boundaries of Paul's sight. And I get why Herbert was frustrated that Paul wasn't received the way he intended. But making the reader sort of complicit in Paul's victories and then twisting the knife of their consequences is to me far more effective than having Chani explicitly remind us that the prophecy is evil. And in the book, the compelling nature of Paul as a character is not that he's some evil maniac, it's that he's not self-serving. He's convinced that the Fremen War will be uncontrollable unless he takes power, and we wrestle more with the nature of that conviction than the motivations of the man who holds it. The film seems to sort of reverse this condition, focusing on how much death Paul will cause when he pulls the lever and sort of failing to establish that he knows the alternative is worse if he doesn't. And significantly, Villeneuve builds a character-defining decision moment in Paul's resistance towards heading south and drinking the water. This is a novelty to the film. There is no north-south divide in the book, and it all sounds good, right? Building out the Fremen culture more, though that kind of just goes nowhere, but that's fine. In terms of story writing, this addition is actually pretty huge, because now Paul's major turning point isn't after he drinks the water, it's before it. We spend ages establishing that the fundamentalists in the South will be uncontrollable. We spend ages hearing Paul say he'll never go there. And then it's almost blink and you miss it, and he's done the thing he swore never to do. From there, the plot kicks into high drive, and we barely have time to process what's happened. Paul goes full colonial religious despot, he's a total jerk to Chani, and the small extent to which he was our narrative guide is literally blown up. And it is exhilarating. There is this surge of cinematic momentum that overwhelms your senses in the moment, but in retrospect, it's perplexing as hell, which takes me to the two possible explanations. The first is, I think, the more obvious one, and it's basically the tragic arc of the Godfather. You know, man who swears never to do bad thing does bad thing, and also loses his morally pure girlfriend. And that's a great story. I wouldn't mind if that's how Villeneuve chose to deliver us Paul. But stories like The Godfather work when we ourselves feel the circumstantial inevitability of that downwards arc. 
So as much as I love this play on the hero's journey, you know, Paul literally approaches the literal inmost cave. He has a resurrection. There's literal elixir. It's kind of dramatically bewildering that our protagonist does a full 180 before he drinks the water. Again, drinking the water does alter his being and he does transform from there. But Villeneuve builds out a transformation even before then in the pivotal character altering decision to go south. And what's the reason? Why does he change his mind? Well, Paul Paul didn't foresee Fade Rotha's devastating attack on the siege in the north. And then the desert voice of Jamis tells him he needs to see all he can see. Okay, that might be enough if we hadn't heard Paul stomp around saying he would never go south. But to overturn his one key certainty in a way that changes the fate of the universe, we need way more dramatic emphasis on this causal prompt. Were they winning the war because of Paul's foresight, so if he doesn't develop it further, they'll lose? Maybe, but that's a book reader's inference, and it's kind of a big blank to fill myself, and it's not really depicted as a crucial plot point of the film at all. With a simple edit of having him drink the water up north and then realize he needs to seize control in the south, this could have made a lot more sense. You know, that way there's a small reason why he drinks the water, then he sees all potential futures, and then goes south, manipulates religion, and goes sort of evil, but we understand why it's because he can see all the futures. And that's dramatically significant. Just sending him south this quickly really disrupted my connection with this character. But there's another scene either way that complicates this sequence of events, and it takes me to the second reading of Paul's journey, you know, Revenge Paul. And it's a scene that might get washed away in your overall experience, it did in my first viewing. But when Paul and Jessica first arrive at the siege, you know, the film's just getting started, Paul tells Jessica that he needs to convert the non-believers so he can get his revenge. That's totally out of sync with what we see with him thereafter. And in standard storytelling, the protagonist literally stating his goal in the opening act of the film obviously sets up the rest of the story. So if we take this scene seriously, it really colors everything he does thereafter. We can see every interaction with the Fremen as rhetorically deceptive on his part. And if we go back to Dune Part 1, there's a long scene where he not only lays out a potential plan to marry Irulan and become emperor, but also rehearses the persuasive technique of using his sight to indicate his status. I know you loved a Fremen warrior and lost him in battle. I've seen your dream. As emperor, Dr. Kynes, I can make a paradise for Arrakis with a wave of my hand. And for some examples of Paul being shady from the get-go, for starters, during the Harvester raid with Chani, Paul sort of screws up. He misjudges his plan for cover, and we hear him say, oh shit, as he's running and is caught off guard. In a celebration scene afterwards, he doesn't correct the impression that his luck in not getting killed was actually due to foresight. Why bother writing that oh shit line? Why would Villeneuve write in this ultimately inconsequential misstep if not to indicate that Paul's being deceptive? Paul also knows what the word for desert mouse is, he knows, but he's playing this little humble act and pretends not to. He defers to Stilgar's leadership, but he's already using Stilgar here, and look, I do think there are too many dramatic indicators that Paul really loves Chani for that to be a cynical plan too, but it's hard not to notice that Paul pockets his family ring just as she walks up to him, you know, whispering to his father that he's found his way, but crucially, he doesn't throw it away, he whips it out later, suggesting that maybe he didn't mean he found a way out of his role, but precisely that he found his way in. Maybe he fakes a coma even to manipulate the meaning of Chani's name. And look, this doesn't seem like the best way to portray Paul from the book, but to me, it's far too coherent to dismiss. And sure, maybe Villeneuve's Paul is some combo of the above. Maybe it's intentionally ambiguous. Maybe you think it's a good thing that we can all have our own opinions. But to me, that our main character isn't someone whose motivations we understand. That the literary internal intricacies are rendered into external, causal ambiguity creates a distance between us and Paul that makes the tragedy of his descent too conceptual for me to really care about. 
in tandem with how we don't feel the suffering of the Fremen under his leadership, we just see it implied through flags and burning and Javier Bardem's borderline goofy one-liners, the capacity for deep pain is more like epic spectacle that is far more visually enjoyable, honestly, than it is internally sad. Of course, through Villeneuve's symbolic communication, we can of course read into certain lines and looks and maybe discern that Paul's hand is here circumstantially forced. I'm not in the mood today. Mood? Yeah. What's mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Now fight! But these interpretations are almost extraneous to the narrative that we actually get. Chalamet, as an actor, has tremendous capacity for being charismatic while also seeming internally tortured, and I'd love to see more of that. We also see many visions of his that don't actually happen, but now that his visions are clear and sort of true, I don't expect that we'll examine whether he made the right choice. It may just be implied in subtext, and that's fine. None of this ambiguity ruins the film or anything, and we'll certainly have to see how Villeneuve lands the Bene Gesserit focus in the third film. For now, in part two alone, the way Paul is thus far rendered certainly defines the film as an experiential piece of epic cinema, sort of at a distance from us, rather than a deeply emotional examination of our human instincts in the way that the book works. Be simple. Be direct. Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. To me, what makes Dune Part 2 so incredible is the same thing that holds it back from having more of the intimate character narratives and emotions that I typically expect. Dune Part 2 is spectacle, it's epic, it's grandiose and visceral, and absolutely transports you out of reality for a few hours. I mean, what a gift, right? What a masterpiece. But if I see comparisons to the two towers, I walk in expecting to cry, to feel all the despair and grief and hope and love. So although I enjoyed the crap out of my first viewing, I couldn't help feeling a little out of joint and slightly disappointed. That is, until I stewed over it for a while and went in knowing what to expect and how to enjoy it even more next time. Dune Part 2 is a fantastic mix of advanced techniques and modern styles with what really feels like very old school, even classical storytelling. You know, riding off into the desert, swoony love themes, villains that don't need redeeming backstories, they're just evil and chaotic and delightful to watch, scenes that don't feel the need to hold your hand, they demand your attention. This is not a film to throw on while you scroll on your phone. This is an experiential epic of grand proportion, boldly presenting one coherent directorial interpretation of one of the most influential sci-fi novels of all time, reintroducing a surging wave of young Hollywood talent that marketed the hell out of the entire production and seemed to have fun doing so. So I know, my overall review here might seem contradictory, and it's true that out in the real world in my life, when people criticize Dune, I'm like, no, it's incredible and epic and you don't get it, but when people praise it, I'm like, calm down, it's not that good. So I'm conflicted, I am. It's not what I wanted it to be, but it's incredible at what it is. And yeah, I wish Villeneuve had been a bit more bold in investigating the moral complexities of leadership. I wish he put more dramatic emphasis on ecological exploitation and cultural violence. There are deeply significant parallels to our world that warrant artistic investigation and would, I think, make the film better. But in watching Dune, those are themes and questions that you have to lean in on and examine yourself. And there's lots more to say about this film, obviously. You know, Austin Butler's unbelievable performance, tied with how it's kind of silly that Fade Rotha was just Robin but more evil. But all of my minor thoughts fit into the grander scheme of just letting Villeneuve do Villeneuve and respecting how well he delivered on adapting the heretofore unadaptable. I really do wish this story got under my skin more than it does, but man, getting the tone, the mysticism, the otherworldliness and epic beauty of Dune from the text to the screen is a profoundly oppressive accomplishment and I remain in awe of Villeneuve's work here. I can't wait to see what he does with Messiah and I have faith hmm, that it'll flesh out some of the absences and implications that we have so far. 
I'm sure a lot of these visuals and nightmares will come full circle, and even if it takes years before we get it, I will absolutely be there. I've been referring to how this film isn't as persuasive as it could be, but it is just so compelling. If I'm on social media and I see a clip, I'm watching it. I talked about the visuals in the context of storytelling, but just on their own, they are incredible. The way the light of Arrakis hits Paul's face is a mini story on its own. I love some of the writing, and I could watch a full hour of that final knife fight. Everything is choreographed so delicately and thoughtfully and sort of ethereally, and though I have all these thoughts on how the story itself is rendered, obviously, I'm excited that we have this distinct, confident, artistic production to enjoy, pros and cons and everything all at once. It is phenomenal. And, you know, on the one hand, you can see it as a bummer that you kind of do have to go see Dune at the cinema to get the full effect. But on the other hand, Starry Night doesn't move people to tears on Google Images. And I'd say that as the realms of TV and film merge, perhaps to the detriment of film, as the timing of the pandemic and the streaming industry's takeover seem to really diminish our collective value in sitting in a crowd of strangers and going to another world together, Dune Part 2 is an exciting reinvigoration of cinematic potential. You just have to hear Villeneuve speak in the language he knows best. In other words, we must move with the flow of the process. We must join it. We must flow with it. As ever, thank you so very much for watching. Please do subscribe and let me know what you thought of Dune. If you're a book fan or a newcomer or a David Lynch diehard, please let me know in the comments. Thanks, guys.